Jamie is here. Um, I, I learned about Jamie through a patron. Uh, it turned out that my sensory story time attendance um, had had falled off, or had falled off. Oh, I'm just going to make up language today. <laughs> uh, my attendance. Um, was lacking, and one of my regular families came to me and said, oh, well, I noticed that some of us that have been coming to that, um, your monthly program lands at the same time as Buddy Break, and we're all at Buddy Break. And I said, Beth, tell me more. <laughs> what is Buddy Break? And she said, well, it's this program, it's a respite care program, you know, the parents are able to drop the kids off, and we get some free time to ourselves, um, and, uh, and you seem to be booking your sensory story times at the same time as Buddy Break each month. So I did some Googling, and I found a website, and I found a list of dates, and I said, okay, in my next guide, I will not have my programs on the same day. And then I started to learn more and, and explore and find out, and I called Jamie, and I said, hey, I, I'd like to come out and visit this program of yours and see what it's all about. And maybe since a number of families who were interested in my sensory story time are attending your program, I could maybe visit it and bring some of what I do to you, and so I've been able, I think, to visit maybe three times now. Um, and so I wanted Jamie to come out and talk a little bit about the programming that she's doing um, for special needs ages and audiences. And so here's Jamie Valentini. I'll let her fill in the rest. Well, I'm happy to be here today. And last time I was actually working on my presentation, I was like, okay, what can I tell you guys to help, what questions do you have? So I want to answer any questions that you have or give you some guidance on how to do this. And I know a lot of you guys are already doing it and doing awesome jobs, and I think that's super awesome. So just a little background on me. Um, before I started Buddy Break and working for Chapel Street Church, which is in Geneva, um, I was a special ed teacher for 15 years. So I've been in the special needs world for, um, for about 25 years. So um, it's just a super area that I'm passionate in, and I'm passionate about serving not only the kids, but really the families, um, the moms, the dads, and just, again, I love all the inclusive talk, but um, making sure they feel a part of their community and a part of, again, their library or their church or whatever it be. So I'll start in just telling you what Buddy Break is. Um, Buddy Break, like Jenny said, is a, it's a free respite care program. It was started in Orlando by a mom um, who had a child. She had three, actually. Her baby was born with some significant, significant special needs. Um, and in her journey, found out that there was really no help. Um, that she was caring for her son who had special needs and had these two other girls, but that there was a lack of support, um, a lack of people just to help her get her daily things done. And she thought, well, why isn't the community or why isn't the church stepping up to kind of help? So she created this non for profit um, I think now, 22 years, um, there are over 200 locations um, of Buddy Break across the country. And they are new to Puerto Rico just last year. So we trained, they trained their first church in Puerto Rico. Um, I'm always happy to say that our location in Geneva um, is the biggest. We average about 100 kids every five to six weeks. And I laugh because I don't even know what happens. We have buddy break on Saturday, and I have 112 kids signed up. Um, it's obviously a very big need in the community. I have, I have family after family who will tell me this is the only date night or the date opportunity we have, which is on Saturday from 10 to 1. Um, it's the only time we get to go like to Lowe's or the grocery store by ourselves and it's not a hot mess. Um, so they, I know that parents definitely are looking forward to Buddy Break. And obviously it's super fun for the kids because, because we just run around for three hours. <laughs> so... Um, so that's kind of what Buddy Break is. Let me see up here. And I'll give you guys more details. Um, so again, there's our mission statement. Um, to encourage kids with special needs and their families. Um, we call our friends with special needs our VIPs. Um, a, because it's easier. Um, B, and it sounds obviously a lot more friendly and inviting. Um, so when they walk in, it's not like, oh, tell me who your child is with special needs. Um, it's, hey, who are our VIPs here today? Or that we're celebrating all our VIPs. Um, and then also, Buddy Break is also open to all the siblings. So then again, parents are getting a really true break. It's not just, it's not just the VIPs. And then we call our volunteers who are working one-on-one, -on -one, our buddies. And again, there's my next slide. Is, again, these pictures are a few years old, but this is kind of an average day of Buddy Break. We open up our whole church. Um, 
we have different themed rooms, and the kids are kind of free to roam those areas with their buddies. Um, we have like a like a, a sensory room and a game room, and you name it. I feel like we've done it. Um, this upcoming month is um, circus themed, so we're having a bunch of circus crafts and sensory play and games and all that kind of fun stuff. No one is dressing up as a clown, though, so that is exciting. <laughs> So again, when we looked, what happened actually, we started Buddy Break five years ago, and we really met with our parents, and we said, how can we help you more? How can we support you and your family more? And they all said, we need respite. We need, we need a break um, every now and then. And that's really where the whole Buddy Break came from, their desire to have some time. So I'm not going to show you guys that. So again, this is like what an average day would look like. These are the rooms that we have. And Again, just kind of an idea of opportunities that we have available for all the kids. And let me know again if you guys want like more. I'm assuming that there's not really questions about buddy break. More questions on dealing with kids with special needs. Is that? I think, yeah, I think I was hoping that you could share with us some of how you how you get your volunteers involved and train them, as well as the types of things that you offer during this day. That maybe things that we could adapt and offer. In and what ages is do. it for? So we don't put an age gap on it. Um, Nathaniel's Hope, the big non probably that's everything, they have the age of 2 to 14. Um, but we have really felt that we've opened it up. We've never said no to anybody. Um, now, obviously, if I would say it's geared towards children. So we've had like a 25-year-old, but on a cognitive ability who's probably performing at like a, a 5-year-old level. Um, I wouldn't take a high-functioning 37-year-old with autism. Um, but as long as we're kind of all in the same cognitive ability, it's work that I haven't had to say no to anybody. So right now our oldest is 25. Um, our youngest will be 20 months this weekend. Um, another awesome opportunity is I have, I do have a 35-year-old young man, high functioning, and he now works as a buddy with like another buddy. So giving them roles to be part of the ministry, but not really the ministry to them. They're actually there supporting the other you know, kids, especially, which is really exciting for them that they get to be helpers. So here are some, so before Buddy Break, um, so again, everything is one-to-one. -one. So if I have 112 kids signed up, I have 112 volunteers just as their buddy. <laughs> Josh, that's exactly what happened to me. The first time I went out to talk to Jamie. Well, yes. was. You say, what? <laughs> and then I have another probably 15 that are, that are there just to support the day. So they're either working as um, coordinators or they're in a room or they're in charge of food or they're doing something. So I always say I'm so thankful that, um, that I have such a huge supply. I would say over five years I probably have a database now of about 400 volunteers who are super passionate about Buddy Break. And I talk to Buddy Break leaders all the time on this number one thing, like how do you get so many buddies to, to do a buddy break so large. And this is the number one thing I have found that works. When I've paired the child and that buddy together more than one time, they really start to like, they start to have a rapport with that parent, with that kid. And then they start showing up to buddy break to be there for that one person. So that's a big thing. And I, it did not take me, it took me about a year or two to learn that. Um, because I'd have random people show up and say, okay, you go with that person and, and not have any rhyme or reason when I was pairing them. But now I have people, I have buddies who are showing up for their VIP because they've been there for five years serving together. And they know mom's name, they know dad's name, they know birthdays, and it's this beautiful relationship. That, and that's really the goal, is getting, like I have found, when you, get, when you get your volunteers to emotionally invest in what a typical day looks like for some of these families, like really, that hearts are tugged. Um, and I have some awesome videos that I've used for my training just, again, to... It's so important that your volunteers understand the struggle um, because their, their days as VIPs and those mom and dad, like their day is so different than a typical day for us. And I think once they understand that, um, they want to be a part of that and they want to serve and they want to be there and, and help as much as they can. So this is just basic etiquette that I always teach all my volunteers. Some of you might already know this. Um, Is this stuff you want to go over? Is this stuff that we know? Or you want to talk about it a little bit? Let's My go over presentation it. is literally like 40 pages long, so I don't want to bore you guys. I was actually finished with last night, and I'm like, I think I'm a little passionate about special needs. Um, so I want to like I want to give you every like what you need. 
So if you feel like this is, okay, we know this, don't talk about it. Do you have teen volunteers as well as adult volunteers or only adults? No, nope, I have teen too. Teen. So um, they have to be in fifth grade to work with a sibling. So if I have little, you know, the sister who comes who's in third grade, she can be paired with a fifth grader or older. But to work with, with a VIP, they have to be 16 or older. And again, you have to be so intentional about some of those pairings, right? About like, okay, if someone has a meltdown, are they really going to be able to hand that kind of meltdown? But I have rock star teenagers who, like, literally, like, show up month after month, and I'm like, wow, like, you kind of got beat up last month, and you're still here. You're like, um, because sometimes, especially in these ministries, I mean, it can, it can, it can be ugly. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have been a part of that, but it could be, um, it could be different. Um, than what we're obviously used to. So I'll just go over a few of these that I think are so important and where I see sometimes we can be better at um, is the first people language. Again, this is not new terminology, but it's saying something like that child with autism or that, like, you know, that young girl with Down syndrome instead of saying that autistic kid or you know, that Down syndrome boy. Um, not obviously identifying the child or the adult before you identify their disability. Because they, they are not their disability, they are a person, and then they have a disability. Does that make sense? I get I think everyone knows that. Um, sometimes I even struggle with this, is knowing and naming what they can do over what they can't do. And I'll be completely honest, in 20 years, sometimes that's super hard not to identify like the things that they cannot do or how to meet their needs because because they can only do so much. Um, but again, understanding the good things. Um, I actually just had a recently a, a child at, at church who is severely autistic and has struggled for a number of years. And there have been days where it is hard for me to find the good or the positive part of it. Um, but when he comes in and he smiles, it like lights up the whole room. So it's like, okay. That's his thing. That's what we're going to focus on, that he can bring that smile to us every Sunday or every Saturday that we have buddy break. So, again, focusing on the things that they can do. Um, and we can, well, I'll talk more about this later, but I don't know if it's going to struggle for you guys, but sometimes when you have children who are nonverbal, like what that looks like and how you can really incorporate them into story time or into whatever you're doing. So I'll give you some tools to do that, but um, you have to be creative and you have to obviously give your volunteers those materials to be creative on how to communicate with someone who is nonverbal. But we'll talk about that a little more. Okay. Um, another thing I see a lot of times is um, like wheelchair etiquette. Um, and I laugh because sometimes, I mean, sometimes you'll see things modeled because that's what the parents are doing, but it's obviously different for us when we're engaging with them. Um, where people are using like a wheelchair as something to kind of lean on or to hang coats on or hang their purse on or used in that kind of um, matter. But obviously we want to always know and respect that a wheelchair is just a, a part of them and part of their body. So using that space um, with etiquette and with manner. Um, So when we're meeting our VIPs, so I always tell my volunteers, when parents are walking in at 9 a.m. with sometimes like five children, um, we are going to welcome them like so, like so wonderfully. We're going to let them know that we're excited to see them, um, even if they literally come in kicking and screaming. Um, but that we're happy that they're there, that um, buddy break, a lot of times this is the first time parents have dropped their kids off with, like, I mean, if you think about it, literally with strangers for first time families. And not only they're dropping their children off, they're dropping off their child that has special needs. So it's a really big deal on how we, how those first ten minutes go when they walk in the door. So again, we're we're welcoming them, and and I always tell my families, for being a sensory friendly event, um, families are walking into a hallway where I have 100 volunteers, and I have over, uh, you know, that I have 100 kids and 100 parents. So it is not even close to being anything sensory friendly, but. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's get in the hallway and then get out so we can kind of make that environment a little more, you know, a little more exciting, a little more sensory friendly. But again, when parents come in, um, and I'm sure you guys have all seen this um, with what you're doing, is 
depending on the day, parents can be very open with what they share or they don't want to share anything at all. So really kind of measuring um, their conversation skills and engage with their body language because I've had parents who, who don't want to tell me anything and then when we have to come back and say, hey, we had a really rough day today, so you know this happened, they will say something like, oh yeah, I didn't tell you that this morning, or um, yeah, I didn't feel like talking about that this morning, and, and those kind of things would have helped the three-hour buddy break go a lot smoother. So um, just being mindful on what they want to share and respecting that. So let me look up there today. So, when we have buddy break, all the parents are required to fill out um, what we call like an IEP. Um, it's like a seven page document that will list all of their needs on it. And some parents will go through very quickly because special needs families are filling out paperwork all the time. Um, so I'm very, I'm very lenient on what they complete as long as let's say the top four things that I need to know to care for them the best in three hours is completed. Um, so if there's anything new that day, I'll always tell my, my volunteers, just ask, hey, how, you know, is Johnny, how's the morning going? Is there anything I need to know today? And if not, then everything is already in that document and we're good to go. Let's move on. Make sense? Okay. I feel like I'm just talking. So if you guys have any questions? Mm -hmm. um, again, this is just some more etiquette that we give our volunteers. Um, I always say, life in the special needs area, there's never two same days. Um, every buddy break is completely different. We are very excited at the end of buddy break when we haven't had to call 911 or when everyone's leaving without something serious happening. happening. Um, when someone didn't have a meltdown, when they didn't have a meltdown, it's, it's always different. So understanding that. Um, a lot of times I'll hear things like, well, this kid has autism and that kid has autism, and kind of compare them. Um, and obviously, as we know, there are no two children, no two children that are alike, especially those that on, are on the spectrum um, and, and are with some of these disabilities. So I have this video to show. Do you guys want it? Okay. Let's see if this will work. This is just an example of what it's like for someone with autism. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear that. Other speaker bounce out of PowerPoint into graph. Okay. Again, I'm sure this is all things that you guys are already doing to maximize abilities for children with special needs. I'm sure you all are making accommodations already. Um, you're going to have to be creative, obviously, when working with this population. And, and I always use the word flexible. Um, there are a lot of times where I have this really great schedule, this great plan, and it goes nothing like the original plan. So that comes with the nature of working with this population. And you really have to be okay with that. Um, because that's sending a message then to the kids that it's okay or not okay. Um, but there also are boundaries to set. So we'll talk more about some great tools that I've used and have had success with. Um, present choices all the time. A lot of times, especially when you get with your older population, they want to be able to make a choice. So are we going to do puzzles or are we going to do a book or something along those lines. And even your nonverbal person, right, you can go up to and say, hey, do you want to work with puzzles or a book? And they'll be able to point to your hand to say one or the other. Um, same thing with our yes or no. You know, do you have a lot of kids that we are seeing are in the acts of being potty trained or not there yet? So asking simple um, questions is a key for any really child with special needs. Just typically, especially kids on the spectrum, you're going to use simple language and right to the point. Um, a lot of words is too much for them to process. So keep it very simple or ask just yes or no. Did you like that story? Yes or no. 
I brought these really cool, I wanted to bring these really cool, um, have you ever seen the Staples commercial, like you push the Staples mm -hmm. button? Um, well, they have those, we call them, I want to say we call them push buttons, but that is not the right word for them. But anyways, I have two, a green and red. You know, and you can actually speak into them and say, that story was great, or that story was awful. And the kids can, they, the kids can you know, which one do you think? And they push the button. So again, hearing that, hearing that voice um, for those who are nonverbal. I use them all the time. Actually, out here we have, um, every Wednesday afternoon, I go to Markland, which is our adult um, facility out here with a profound um, adults with disability and reuse those talkers all the time. A lot of them will have enough ability to push a button to hear something, but obviously don't have a lot of other skills to, to, to communicate. So something like that would work really great. And again, this is something I'm sure everyone knows. Um, using positive reinforcement. Um, trying to redirect, and again, just keeping them going by using positive um, support. A lot of times, again, with the kids on the spectrum, the terms first and then um, are something that they're hearing every day at school. So first we're going to do story time and then we can play. Um, using those kind of words are triggers for them because it's something they're used to hearing um, within their school day. And again, triggers like the order of operations. What are we going to do first and then what's next? <clears throat> so let's get that. So, these are just some tools that I've used in the past that like, we always have on hand that are super helpful. So different kind of fidgets. Um, sometimes these wonderful lights that we have everywhere can be way too much, especially for our kids in the spectrum. So those little covers, you literally can buy them for like $5. And sometimes I'll put them up just for Sunday um, during our um, Sunday school and take them off right afterwards. They also make big long sheets that are almost the same size as your panel. You just kind of drape it in underneath the tiles, and it kind of just dims that light so it's not so fluorescent. And even though you and I cannot hear the buzzing sound going on, um, I'm, I've heard that's a big trigger for a lot of our kids on the spectrum. We always, everywhere in our building, have noise-canceling um, headphones everywhere. So if you don't have them, I would encourage you to either get those, or now they're making disposable little earplugs. So um, they're super tiny, and then you can just throw them away, and they're super cheap, so you can find those on Amazon. Um, any kind of fidgets are awesome. So I use these. A lot of my children like to put things in their mouth. Um, so any like oral um, fidgets, or now they make them at the very end of their pencil, or there's something that you can attach to crayons and markers, are just great ways, again, for them to get out some of their, um, their fidgets. Um, there's also TheraBands. Have you guys ever heard of those? I forgot to put the picture. But TheraBand is like, it looks like... Um, an elastic rope that you would almost tie to the very bottom of your chair and the kids can just kick it while they're sitting there in story time. This is not new news. I feel I see a lot of you guys waving your heads, which is like really awesome that you guys have heard of this stuff already. So I included something that's a huge part of a success for me is having any type of visual. If you don't have a visual, I would strongly encourage you to have one, just an order of events during what you're doing. I was having fun on Board Maker yesterday and found some <laughs> fun library ones. So again, um, I use the, um, it's called Board Maker Online. Um, it's like super, super cheap. I want to say it's maybe $9 a month, but you can go in there and un make unlimited um, schedules. And a lot of these that I found for you guys are already there and made for you. So you just have to print and laminate. Um, but again, just giving your families um, an order of sequence on what they're expected to do. And we, so when we, our friends walk in to buddy break, they have a, if the ones that need it will have a visual schedule. Here's the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth thing that has to happen. And a lot of times it's what has to be done, and then it's finished. And it is so funny, because to me, obviously, like, I can't wrap my brain around needing to know I have to do something and then completing it. But on Sunday morning for our Sunday school, like, like it is massive problems if we don't take it off the Velcro and put it into the next section. So, um, again, a lot of this is things that your kids are probably seeing Monday through Friday at school. So I won't take much time on any of these. These are just ones I saw and I thought about you guys. So, um, again, here is um, an option for a child who is nonverbal. Yes or no. 
I went to my conference last weekend, and we have some of these. And I, I'm sure you guys talked about this with the Culture City, right? This is the big thing, right? Everybody was talking about at the conference that Culture City has these new sensory bags. Now, even though, if anything what this bag says to me is when you walk in and you're a mother or father of a child with special needs, it's saying at least they're, at least they're aware. At least they're making the effort to show they care. So, over anything, I would say that's the message we want to send to all of our families, that we are thinking about your family, and we're going to make some considerations. We talked a lot about Culture City, actually, this past weekend at the conference. And, um, of course, I was like, why didn't I think of that? Like, that was a great idea. But, guaranteed, three people on their staff are probably trained to do something. Um, but it's more of an awareness than anything. Um, I've had a lot of families recently actually go to a Bulls game. Um, a, because tickets are so cheap. But, um, <laughs> but it was part of somewhere out here, um, I can't even think, maybe it was Easter Seals that took um, a bunch of their families to the Bulls game. And they, and they loved it. And it, it, for a lot of families, it's a place where their child can go and be so loud, and they're not going to get dirty looks from anybody. So uh, yeah. they enjoyed that experience. Now, a child on the spectrum, Maybe that would be different, um, those who are obviously overwhelmed by all the noise. But to me, this sends a huge message to say, we see you and we're not going to ignore you. Um, so yeah, so we have these at church too. They don't look as pretty as, these are the ones I saw at the conference and I thought, hmm, these look a little prettier than mine. Maybe I need to work on mine. Mm -hmm. um, so outside of Buddy Break, we have what we call M Club. And this is for our adults with special needs. So what happened is we were serving all these families on Sunday, and then all their kids grew up. So uh, when they turned like 18, we were like, okay, they don't really fit in with what we've been doing, so let's create something new. So now we have M Club. Um, we meet this second Friday of every month, and we do all kinds of things. Um, always a craft. We always do some type of story. Um, and then it's kind of just hangout time. I always tell my volunteers, because the average age is probably 27. What, what, would you, what did you do at 27? What did you like doing? You like to sit with your friends and hang out. Um, so that's really what I'm encouraging my volunteers to do. Um, let's just have fun and enjoy each other instead of feeling that we had to you know, plan something. Um, and it's, to be honest, it's sometimes really difficult to plan for this population because you weren't planning for anything when you were 27, right? You just wanted to hang out with your friends. It wasn't like, let me plan activities for the two hours that we're together. So a lot of it is just, we have games, we have table games, but a lot of it is just sitting and laughing and, and kind of just really engaging with each other. We started this um, actually in the fall, and we probably had four or five kiddos that would come. Um, it's always, again, one-to-one. -one. And I always tell, it's one-to-one -one because we tried not one-to-one. -one. And then one of our friends went out in the hallway to play with this beautiful little nativity scene. And we didn't even notice that she was gone. Um, until I walked out to go to the bathroom and I'm like, oh, well, there's, there's Kara just, just playing. And nobody knew she was gone. Um, so now it is always one-to-one. -one. Um, just so again, because sometimes there are meltdowns or there are opportunities, you know, there, there are times that, Someone has to leave the room, and we want to make sure that everybody is safe. So our last month, we met, and there we all are. So it is, again, um, this is a group. I was actually looking at some research yesterday, and this is a group that's totally underserved in our community. Um, there are tons of stuff, um, and, and a lot of families will say, when our kid was 5 or even 10, um, everyone thought they were so cute. And... Um, really want to engage and there were so many opportunities in the community but now at the age of 27 um, there isn't anything um, and I'm sure that most of you know um, after their 21st birthday they age out of the system and the opportunity is is very very limited and that's what I'm finding with a bunch of my family um, so if you aren't serving your adults yet I would um, say it's something to really consider and to think about um, and that's when I meet with my parents and I'll say things like, how can we help you guys more? They'll say, the social opportunities for our kids are pretty much zero. Um, a lot of them are working on finding jobs. 
Um, a lot of times the parents are still working, so then finding transportation to jobs or schools or whatever it is, is just really, um, it's just really a struggle. So um, we have talked about doing some type of story time um, or something. Again, it's actually it's one of my favorite nights because it's I don't have to plan a lot. It's really just sitting around and laughing, and that's what they want. They want to come up and just show and, and, and belong to something. So this is what we call M Club. We did last year, we went bowling. I'm working up the nerve to do that again this year. But it was it was a lot of fun. We talked about the movie theater or to go bowling again. Um, that's it. That was my 30 to slide presentation. <laughs> so, Jamie, talk yep. a little bit about when you bring your volunteers in, what are, what, how many hours of training do you require of them before they can be a buddy to a VIP? They do an hour and a half of training. So they come an hour and a half before buddy break, um, and that's when we do our training. So we go over all the stuff that I kind of went over, I just actually cut and paste a lot of my training material into this presentation and there are a few more videos that we watch um, that just show examples and situations or scenarios um, and then I would say about once every like every third buddy break I'll have someone come in and teach a lesson on like what to do in case of a meltdown what to do we have a lot of kids who are having seizures um, so what to do in case of a seizure um, so usually situational on what I'm seeing at buddy break is what we do a quick 15 minute lesson on, and I'll have a nurse come in or an ABA therapist, um, whoever it be that's an expert in that area, just do a quick little training. Um, and then for, for M Club, um, again, all these parents fill out a very quick one page, like what, what do I have to know for an hour in caring for your adult? And at this point, things are easier because parents have managed the behavior and have managed the disability. And, and, and the, you know, a lot of these kids will be like, I have autism and I don't like that, you know, so they even know what their needs are. So it's easier to then to train and to, and to plan for. So your earlier slide showed all the different rooms for yeah. your buddy break. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very big space, obviously, that it's you a have. Very big space. Yeah. 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 We probably, it's a large church. Um, and and we're not even allowed to go in our big um, like our big sanctuary area, which is a big open room. It'd be really great if we could get in there. But there's also lots of band equipment, which a lot of my friends like. <laughs> so therefore, we stay out of that room. But yes, it's a it's a large. Did space. it start in that space, or it, did, you, it did, did you grow into that space, or did it always start? It off always when you had stayed band? into like moving around everywhere. We tried one month to do more of like a. From this time, we're all going to be in this room, and then we'll move to the next room, and we'll move to this next room. And that was a disaster. Um, the transitional part, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably seeing that, is the number one struggle sometimes is just getting a child to go from activity A to activity B. So, so now it's you have the three hours to really do what you like to do, and um, and we do big group things that are optional within Buddy Break. And you're bringing people in from the community. Yeah. Um, so I reached out to Jamie when I heard that we were. Con a conflict and uh, I decided to move my story time so that it wouldn't be a conflict and then went out and so I when I have visited I've taken about 30 minutes worth of what I would do in a sensory story time a story some play-doh something tactile some puppets um, and I'll go out and I just set up in the lobby area and whoever wants to come and go can come and go so if there's nobody sitting there at the time I just start and eventually, it'll grab somebody's attention. Oh, what, she's over there, and she's reading, and she's talking, and then they'll come, and they'll join me. So it's very fluid. I Sometimes I'll do the story twice. Sometimes I've only done the story once. Sometimes they're more interested in the, the things I have on the table. I think I did frogs once, and I had green Play-Doh. So everybody got to hold and squish some green Play-Doh, and I, was, I just let them take it with them if they wanted to take it with them or throw it away when they were done. Um, so I'm just one of those stations that they can come and go and wander. Um, and I've had as many as 12 to 20 yeah. choose to stop by and hang out by me. Some of them have stayed for five minutes and some of them have stayed for the whole time that I'm there at the table. And then who else in the community here? You've had the local art so school. this month, yep, we have um, the police department coming. So they'll come with their car and they'll come in uniform and talk to the kids and kids will get to visit the car. We have Bill chose um, Taekwondo. So they'll come with, a, actually they always come with a huge group of volunteers. Um, but we'll, they'll do some type of um, 
like performance, and then we'll have one-on-one -on -one time with each kid, kicking and punching and all that great stuff. Um, this month we also have therapy dogs coming, uh, which are always a hit. Um, and maybe one more, let me get and we have a face painter. So, um, but yeah, usually I try to reach out to someone in the community, only because then I send that home with parents, like, hey, you know, the public library was here today, and it's so. Like, to me as a parent, that's so great to see that the community is doing this together, that we're trying to reach all these families. How do families hear about you? That's a great question. Yeah, is it word of mouth? It's Maybe? word of mouth. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we first started, we did, like, we shared with all the therapy centers. Um, it has gotten so big now that the public school system will reach out in the fall and say, hey, can we have your buddy break dates? We want to put them in the folders of all the IEPs. Um, we don't advertise. Every once in a while, I'll put a post up, more or less looking for volunteers. But um, another really great opportunity is around here, all of our schools will do um, like a fair, like a resource fair, a special needs resource fair. And I always will have a booth there. Um, I went to four this year just to say, hey, this is who we are, this is what we're doing right now for the community. And a lot of times they're surprised that it's free or that they don't pay anything. We take all of your children, so, um, but now it's definitely word of mouth. And I've had families now who, who literally in five years have not missed one buddy break. Um, so yeah. Do we have a background check here as all volunteers? All of them. Yeah, so we have a lot of paperwork to do to be a volunteer because we're a church. So not only do you have to be a background check, but they have to do some then paperwork for, for just us. sort of structure or like maybe we'll do this sort of yes. thing or how do you so it always starts with a pizza that? party okay. um, so we order pizza and have pizza we start with that and then we have a craft and then we'll have games we have a story um, so yeah there is there is a very lenient structure to it um, none of the kids that are coming right now are ones that need to know what's happening next um, I've met with other people who are serving adults, and sometimes that structure works really well. It's something they have to have to make it successful. Um, but ours is more on the laid back because, again, we've got that older. We have a 35 year old who comes and is like, nope, I'm not doing that crap, or I'm not <laughs> doing this. Um, so, and again, it's really hard when serving adults to find the, the right curriculum or the right books um, because what they can read or understand is at the preschool or very low elementary level. So again, not offending them by using that material, but obviously giving something that they're interested in. Actually, I always say, if I can clone myself, that's what I like, that's where I feel like some money could be possibly is making curriculum that could really be beneficial for this audience because it's, as you know, um, super difficult. How do you handle the the entrance and the exit of all these families. If, for example, you have uh, 115 VIPs, maybe 30 families, if each family does a seven-page IEP and there's a start time, you know, does everybody come at once? Can they do the IEP in advance? Yes. So um, they are emailed the link to do um, the IEP. And they have to send it back to me within five days before buddy break. So I have all that paperwork. I have these two file cabinets. I have every child and, and their IEP. It's already, this, I don't do that part, a lovely volunteer comes in and makes sure that's nice and organized for me. So then in the morning, my volunteers come, um, if they're coming for a training, they come an hour and a half before buddy break. If they're just there, what we call them returning buddies, they come about 45 minutes prior. And I have all this fun, all these fun snacks for them. But they come and they check in with our registration people. They grab a white card with the child's name on it and they grab that child's file. They then have like the next 20 minutes to look at all that information. A lot of the personal stuff um, I'll cross out, but a lot of it is just, again, how to care for their child best. Um, and then after they're done, they return that file. Then we go downstairs, and we're all in a long lobby of alphabetical order, lining up. And then the, the families start coming in, so they check in with upstairs. They have to wait until 10 o'clock. I always say then I open the gates. <laughs> and then they come down. and. I try to encourage my buddies to be super quiet downstairs because, again, there's already so much noise coming down, and it looks like an airport. We're all standing alphabetized, <laughs> holding up these white cards, and that's how the kids, I mean, sometimes the kids will walk in and be like, all right, I see my buddy, like, and now know how it works. 
Um, but all of the buddies are holding the signs, the family finds them, and they do their introduction part. Um, all of our names, so the buddy's holding one, and right behind the buddy is then hooks that look something like that, but like, you know, some of them. Um, and then right above the hook is the child's name. So the lunch bag, the coat, all that goes on the hook. And then, and then they're released. Yeah, and then pickup is not so pretty. Um, <laughs> I always tell my families, if you've got somewhere to go by 1.30, I would encourage you to get here about 15 minutes. We are still using a pager system. Um, so yes, so families walk in, I push the three-digit page, I push send, and then I hope and pray that the pager is on the buddy and that they come up with the child. A lot of times, like, families are waiting there for like 20, like moms are like, literally waiting for 20 minutes. And I'll say, I'm going to assume by this time that your child doesn't want to leave buddy break, so why don't you go look for them? Um, and a lot of times that is, a lot of times that's the, the case, that they are in the train room and they have been there for three hours and they are not leaving. So, um, so then we obviously work with that situation. I envisioned the first time I visited that I'd be at a table and that parents would want to, you know, come over and say, oh, and what is this? And, and I watched this process and I decided that what would be best yeah. is if I'm in and out before that happens and I can leave behind some lovely examples of what the library offers to put on the parent information table, yes. that, that chatting with me at, at dismissal time was probably not what they wanted to do. Yes. <laughs> oh, there is a lot of like, I don't want to leave buddy break and I'm going to leave thinking and screaming. Um, and a lot of times families are coming with more than one child, so it, it is, it is. Like I said, not as pretty. Is that right? Yeah. Any more questions? Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Um, if you guys have any questions, I will leave my contact information with Jenny. If you guys have questions, um, as you guys know, I'm super, I'm super passionate about all this stuff. So if you ever have questions, I would love to send a helping hand. Thank you.